Livermore. They have been serving there almost 20 years. They've got a 20-year anniversary with that church coming up in August of this year. Uh, Mike has been serving in ministry for 30 years, part of that time spent with uh, the Broken Arrow Church. And this church loves you guys dearly and has continued to appreciate the relationship that you have had together over the years. Mike and Debbie have been married for 40 years. They have four children and 10 grandchildren. He's a graduate of Sunset uh, Bible Institute and Sunset School of Missions. He's been on mission trips to Scotland and India, Mexico and Nigeria. He's continued to do training in, in the fields of marriage and uh, parenting, getting certifications in both of those areas and I know blessing many, many people. And just the long tenure that you've had there at Blue Star, I know has been a blessing to that congregation. Uh, you've been through a lot of things with a lot of people over those years, and uh, that is invaluable in congregational ministry. So Mike, uh, we appreciate you being willing to come share a message with us in this cloud of witnesses study, tonight looking at Abigail. So come on up, let's pray together, and we'll give you the remainder of, of the time that we have before the Devo. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much for your great love and your great mercy and grace that you have shown us through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we know uh, that what we deserved was punishment, what we deserved was separation from you. But Father, thank you for allowing your son to endure what he did so that we might enjoy that relationship with you. Father, we thank you for the, the family that we're a part of in him and Father, uh, for the extended family that, that we have around this world uh, in places like India and Ukraine and Cambodia, but Father, brothers and sisters, very, very near to us. So we thank you for uh, the church family at Blue Star. We thank you for Mike and Debbie and their nearly 20 years of ministry there. Thank you for their faithfulness, their perseverance, and Father, just continue to bless them with uh, courage, with insight, with, with discernment as they continue to minister in the name of your son in that place. Open our hearts and our minds to your word through Mike tonight, we ask in your son's name, amen. Amen. If you have your Old Testaments, you might want to uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Whenever uh, Tim contacted me, he told me that uh, you were going to talk about different characters and uh, I kind of looked at the listing that he had, and uh, I'm always kind of uh, aware of kind of doing something a little different. Now, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the dangerous thing. It just means that I saw all the men in regard to characters, and I thought, well, we got to throw a female in there someplace. And uh, there's a reason for that, because uh, you realize that uh, most men are characters. Um, <laughs> And so uh, we had to throw uh, a female in here to uh, kind of do a little encouragement and building up. Um, this is uh, uh, an interesting story. It's set in the concept of, an, of the Old Testament in the life of David. And um, it's kind of sandwiched in between the idea that uh, David has a little freedom in regard to Saul not pursuing him. He's got a little bit of time that uh, he has a little peace that kind of goes along. That doesn't last very long. Uh, but the, the chapter after this, you realize that uh, the pursuit is on back once again. But there's an amazing story about uh, 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 a gentleman by the name of Nabal and his wife, Abigail. And so I want to read through this story. We're going to make a few comments, and then we're going to come back and, and uh, just uh, kind of make a few points and draw out a few things. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. When David moved down to the desert of Paran, a certain man of Moan, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing at Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in all of his dealings. He was a Calebite. When you look at the standards in regard to uh, the possessions, we're talking about a thousand goats, three thousand sheep. There was 
here was a man that was uh, very good in regard to business. I mean, he had built up a, a good treasure, a good future in regard to, uh, to who he was. And um, in, in the process of his doing that, somehow or another, there was a relationship that was built with a lady by the name of Abigail. Now, <clears throat> marriage at that point in time really uh, was one of those fixed things. I remember when I, uh, I was here at uh, Broken Arrow and uh, took the campaign trip to India, was over there for six weeks. Uh, I actually did a, a marriage while I was over there. You wind up doing a lot of things on the field that you never uh, really plan on or think through and all those type of things. But uh, uh, it, it actually was a marriage of the preacher's daughter to a young man from Trinidad who had just been there uh, for the summer. And uh, you can imagine the conflict. And for some reason, whoever is the American missionary that kind of goes into the field, he has to deal with the conflict. I don't like that because uh, I didn't want to be pulled into the situation in regard to all those things. So, but marriage, even in India, you couldn't get out of the caste system. It was always one of those fixed things. And actually, this preacher's daughter had already been promised to somebody else. There had always been a, already been a fixed relationship. Uh, I tell you that just in order, uh, in thinking about Abigail, that uh, you don't think that she made a foolish choice. You see, she probably wore very nice clothing. She probably had a very nice house. Uh, there would probably be a lot of ladies that actually wanted to be like her. Because on the outside appearance, it seems as though everything was put together. Her future was set. All of those things were there. Let's go on with the story. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel, and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it's shear, uh, sheep shearing time when your shepherds were with us. We did not mistreat them, and the whole time that we are at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward me and toward my men. Since we come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. It was a festive time. It was a, it, it was a normal time in which uh, a man like Nabal and the sheep shearing time that he actually would share what he has with those who were there. You actually see the reference that, uh, Na, uh, that he mentions here with the idea that he's going to give part of the festive feast to the sheep shearers here in just a minute. But what happens with this is, Verse 9, when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal his message to David's uh, in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and meat I have slaughtered for my shears? And give it to men coming from who knows where. You see, one of the interesting things that was already mentioned was that uh, uh, Nabal was a Calebite, uh, meaning he was a descendant of Caleb. It was a favorable, favorable tribe, meaning also that it was a tribe of Judah. It's the tra same tribe that David came from. And yet, here's the conflict. That, that seems to exist here. And whether Nabal actually knew the history regarding David, I don't know. You get the suspicion. 
I, I, I don't think that, uh, that you could confuse the fact that uh, Saul has been looking for David for a long time. I, I think maybe they even passed through Nabal's town, maybe asking where David was and all those type of things. So you get this idea that he probably knew who David was. But you see, Nabal's name actually means fool. Uh, and the name actually uh, that, that is given is, is a name also that is also used with the prophets. See, Nabal actually was his name, but the word was actually used to identify a fool. And most of the time in the Old Testament, particularly in regard to the prophets, this, this idea of Nabal being used is the idea of one who is not spiritual at all. In fact, uh, he negates even the spiritual thought. He doesn't even consider anything spiritual. And so he's turned his back on all those things. Do you realize that even the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 32 actually were called... Nabals. They were called fools because they had discredited, they turned their back upon what God had done for them. And so the nature in regard to Nabal is there. Uh, when I did a little uh, research in regard to the Hebrew word, it, it's interesting that uh, one of the definitions or translations regarding Nabal, fool, is the idea of being dull. It's not that... Uh, Nabal was dull in regard to being boring, uh, in regard to Abigail. It was that he is another definition of Webster's Dictionary that we don't use. He was insensitive. Could you imagine being married to somebody who is constantly insensitive? It's not a surprise here. I mean, this isn't a surprise regarding Nabal. You get the understanding that this is a typical thing that he did. This is a typical thing that, that she was always having to deal with. And I'll look at that a little bit more here in just a minute. Verse 12. David's men turned away and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to the men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And, notice this statement, David strapped on his sword. While 200 men, 400 men went with, up with David, while 200 men stayed with the supplies. Now, <clears throat> I don't know whether, uh, how that affects you, but I think to myself, this is like using a shotgun to kill a fly. Right? I mean, here's this, this one man. Uh, and here's David, who's going to take 400 men across country or out of the mountains, down the hill to take care of Nabal. Let's introduce Abigail. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time that we were out in the fields near, near them, nothing was missing. Night and day they were a wall around us the whole time that we were herding our sheep near them. Now, think it over and see what you can do. Isn't it interesting that the servant didn't go to Nabal and try to convince him to reverse his decision. But he actually goes to Abigail. I get a little feeling that this isn't the first understanding of Abigail. I get the feeling that there's something that's just natural regarding Abigail's life. You know, the reference back in verse 3 was the idea that she was intelligent and a beautiful woman. I get the understanding that she had great discernment. She had wisdom. 
which, by the way, is the opposite of a fool. So verse 18, Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five shes of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins, and two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on the donkey. And I'm thinking, that must be quite a cafeteria, right? So she loaded them on a donkey. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. I have my suspicions why she didn't tell him. Don't you? And I also realize that she's trying to save everybody's life here. She knows exactly what's going to happen out of this. As she came riding her donkey into the mountain ravine, there were David and his men, 400 men descending. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Can you imagine what that looks like? Here they are descending uh, toward her, and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless. Now, get this scene here. All the way down here, I ha have no idea what time span this has taken, but David is still angry. He's still writhing over the idea of what Nabal's response was. And he's just said... It's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the, in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David. Be it ever so severely if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. David was going to take care of this guy. And not just him, but all of his household. Maybe that's why he was taking the 400 men with him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off the donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you, hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention to the Lord, to my Lord, to that wicked man Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool. Ah, uh, Wow. I mean, uh, I mean, she just puts it out there, right? She just drops the bomb. And she, uh, she, she ends this by saying, and folly goes with him. Now, I'm doing all this in order that you might understand this isn't just a one-time occurrence. This is Abigail's life. She's always fixing things. <clears throat> now, I, I know this is a dangerous thing, and, and please don't raise your hands, okay? But some of you ladies that are sitting out there, you must be talking about this guy sitting over here, right? Sometimes you have to fix things. Sometimes it's just not there. I'm going to tell you it's a little bit more prevalent than, than what we're going to see in just a little bit mi in a minute with what we have here. So, you come to this point and you realize that she continues to say in verse 25, And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. And now, my Lord, as surely the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies will be hurled away as from the pocket of a sling. She knows exactly who David is. She knows the story of the Philistine. Uh, she, she knows that God, Jehovah God, has been with him. She recognizes that. 
And so I don't think there's any mistake that Nabal also knew that. So you go on. It says, when the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord everything, uh, every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience a staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success, remember your servant. Abigail knew how to butter David up. But that's not necessarily a fair statement. Abigail was wise. She knew how to think through things. And once again, I remind you, she probably had lots of practice. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to, to, to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not quickly come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Abigail, uh, Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought to him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. So, <clears throat> Nabal ought to be happy. Well, he is happy uh, only because he's drunk. It says in verse 36, when Nabal, or Abigail went back to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife took him all these things and his heart failed him and he became like a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. You know, I, I suppose there's some suspicions here about what happened, whether he became so angry that he just had a heart attack. I mean, it seems as though that, that almost seems to take place regarding all those things that happened. Uh, and then it always amazed me about uh, David's response, verse 39. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord. Ah. Uh, I suspect that there's probably several other people in that same line. The difficulty that Nabal continued to bring about in all of those things. Uh, so he said, praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, uh, sent him to be uh, the wife, asked her to be the wife. And so she bows down, verse 41, with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and am ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servant. That's exactly what my wife did when I proposed to her. <laughs> I know you believe that, right? Uh, she bowed down. Abigail, uh, verse 42, quickly got on a donkey and tended, and she was attended by her five female servants. I told you she had a good life. Went with David's messengers and became his wife. Let me, let me talk to you a little bit about uh, Nabal. And there's, uh, there's a lot here. It really wasn't until this, stu this study that I uh, just got my concordance out and I went into scripture and I just did some study regarding a fool. And the interesting part about that is that, that except for about five different occurrences, all of those things, uh, uh, particularly the idea of the Hebrew word kesal, shows up in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Ah, 
Let me, let me relate a little bit of that to you. As you read through the Proverbs, you find that uh, a fool's eyes are unable to see a proper way uh, or how to even live in right conduct. He may roam the earth seeking it, but he'll completely miss it. Uh, and apparently he does not concentrate on what's right. Uh, chapter 17, verse 24. The fool imagines that he can buy wisdom when actually he has no inclination for it. The proverb writer will say in chapter 17, verse 16. He takes no delight in understanding. 18.2. He hates knowledge. 1.22. Therefore, he does not choose the fear of the Lord, 129. His end is the end of complacency as a fool, which is destruction, 132. He's a serious menace to the community in which he lives. And I'm, I notice we got our young people here. There's a, there's a few interesting things here. Listen, listen to this. To associate with a fool is to deprive oneself of knowledge. 14.7. Known any fools? Are you friends with a fool? <laughs> I mean, does it, does it happen over and over again? The, you know, you stick your foot back in the hole over and over again. Never learning from those things. He can cause serious problems to his fellow man, for he actually enjoys doing wickedness, 1023. A fool's words bring strife and involve him in blows with all of his acquaintances, 186. Anyone who befriends him will be destroyed, 1320. Parents of a fool suffer tremendously. His mother is grieved because of him, 10-1. And his father can never have any joy over him, 10-1, 17-25, 19-13. Solomon had to bring that up three times for his son. And not surprising is the fact that most fools despise their mothers, 15-20. See, a fool doesn't want to be told what to do. A fool doesn't have to be corrected. Some of the interesting things, particularly for this context of Scripture, I think is Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4, that says, no one, Do not answer a fool according to his follies, lest you also be like him. Listen to that. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. That's exactly what was happening to David. David got lured into that trap. He got lured into it. And he was going to go take care of it. And Abigail knew Exactly. If that's what you're going to do, you're going to regret it one day. When the Lord makes you king and when you look back upon this and your conscience has to deal with this idea of, of what you're going to do in retaliation. Anybody ever retaliate? Anybody ever regret doing such a thing? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 9 says, Do not speak in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the words of your wisdom. No wonder Abigail didn't tell Nabal that she was going. 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. 29 verse 9 says, when a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, listen to this, <laughs> when a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages and laughs, and there is no rest. Okay, you got the picture of Nabal. 
You want to marry him, right? That's exactly the guy you want to marry. Hers was probably a fixed marriage. But how foolish is it to marry a fool? It wasn't her choice, probably her parents' choice. But we have a choice today. Young people, you have a choice today about who's going to be your spouse, who you're going to ask to marry you. How are you going to find out whether they're a fool or not? Well, you don't get married in two weeks. I have actually known people that have done that. And some of them come out well, some of them haven't. It's really a wise thing to consider and to think who you're going to date. I mean, if, if you look at somebody and, and they are constantly getting themselves in trouble, constantly avoiding the idea of thinking about doing the right thing, he is the wrong guy. I, I would actually tell you, don't kiss too fast. Nabal looked really good on the outside with all of his possessions. He probably drove the best shiny wheeled chariot you ever saw. <laughs> Abigail was intelligent. She was a beautiful woman. 33, David praised her for her good judgment and her courage. When I, uh, when I thought about this lesson, I thought about some other passages of Scripture. I want to ask that you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, I wish I could tell you that all marriages and relationships do well. But we're pretty naive if we believe that love doesn't have its challenges. That relationships don't have their challenges. But the wise thing is not to walk into a foolish relationship. That's the wise thing. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 says, Wives in the same way submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and the reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right, and do not give way to fear. This, uh, this story of Abigail renews in my mind this exhortation from Peter. And I want to say to the Abigails out there who are living with Nabals, who are living perhaps with somebody that is not spiritual at all, will not even consider this idea of dull, will not even consider the spiritual life. Do I have three minutes? Two. Won't even consider the spiritual life. That you need our encouragement. 
You need to know that doing the right thing is the right thing. You need to know that pleasing the Lord is the right thing to do. David says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. You know, the thing about Abigail is that she didn't forsake her commitment to Nabal. It seems as though she fulfilled her covenant to Nabal. The marriage covenant. She was living in that. But it was a tough road. It was a hard road. But she continued to follow through in that. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, there's this general overall statement in regard to the idea of bearing one another's burdens. And even in the idea of bearing one another's burdens... I think we also understand that that takes place in the marriage relationship. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you too may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. There are some Abigails who are fulfilling the law of Christ and probably for the most part, they're suffering in silence. They're bearing that burden. They're bearing that burden for Christ. And I, I, I just want to say to you, if, if somehow or another that fits you, God bless you. God bless you for holding on to your faith. God bless you for holding on to your covenant, for, for your relationship. Or bearing up during that. And I also know that need to say that, that I've been very familiar with some men who have been married to Nabal's sister. There is a reward. There is a reward coming one day. And that's what you hold on for. I know that's what you hold on for. So may this lesson be for you. May your faith be reassured in knowing that you're doing the right thing. And I pray that God somehow brings some peace in order that all of that difficult time might end. I'm not sure that I would go as far as David and say, praise be to God that Nabal's out of the way. But can I tell you this, and Tim's probably felt this experience, and the elders have felt this experience, that sometimes the difficulties and struggles regarding relationships, sometimes somebody's going to have to be taken out of the way before ever peace comes along. But hold on to Jesus Christ. Right, church? Hold on to Jesus Christ. And hold on to do the right thing. And may you feel the God or the hand of God carrying you through difficult times. We're dismissed to our devotional.